Hello everyone. This is our first lesson on Marxism, and this lesson is about value form theory. This lesson is fundamental to understanding the other lessons in our course, so I highly suggest you watch the whole thing and take notes. On our website, there will be a worksheet that you can use to follow along with, as well as some questions that you should answer at the end of the lesson. You should be able to answer them um, by understanding all the concepts that are gone over in this lesson here. And uh, we'll have some additional reading on our website published too, if you want to look further into it. For all the newcomers here, welcome. Uh, this is our introductory course on the fundamentals of Marxism. And uh, by the end of all these lessons, the goal is um, you will be able to discuss uh, Marxism and be able to uh, understand Marxist concepts uh, more so than the average person. Right. What is value form? Uh, well, to begin with, uh, value form theory is essentially a theory that Karl Marx posed, right? That value, ha it comes in different forms and uh, can be expressed in different ways. But in order to understand value form, we're going to have to have a little bit of background in some economics, right? So this is price theory, right? I'm sure you guys are all familiar with it. You can arrive at the certain price of a product by measuring it in terms of its supply and demand curves. And this uh, theory was uh, brought forth by Milton Friedman and some Chicago School economists and uh, some earlier ones as well that built upon it. Now, the first misconception that we want to do away with here is that value form or any of Marx's concepts on value do not reject this price theory, right? And one of the first things that uh, opponents of Marxism will tell you is that Marxism uh, doesn't understand economics because uh, it rejects the principles of supply and demand. Karl Marx himself would have been one of the first economists to actually agree with price theory. So, um, you know, that, that should uh, be cleared before we talk about value form in more depth. Uh, however, Marx would say that price is not the same thing as value. In fact, price is just an expression of a certain kind of value that we're familiar with in trade, right? So price itself uh, is good in, um, and, and can be measured you know, in terms of supply and demand, right um the, the theory is good i mean but um you know it's not it's not value right as uh, some liberals might lead you to want to believe where does demand come from um the reason we're asking this question is because um other you know more well-read austrians will try and tell you that you know demand is you know the figure through which individuals realize the value of a commodity and uh, the demand, or sorry, the value of a specific commodity is something completely subjective, right? Only the individual can realize it, right? Well, we will answer this question um, on where demand comes from because um, the, the answer that demand, you know, is the representation of, you know, individual subjective value is a little bit faulty. Exchange value. So we talked about price and it being uh, an expression of a certain kind of value, and that's exchange value. Exchange value is essentially uh, the value of a commodity as it relates to all other commodities in a market or um, in any kind of exchange. And it can be illustrated uh, similar to this. And this is kind of what Marx would call primitive exchange. This is the general form of value, right? And that a certain amount of a certain commodity uh, is equal to the certain amount of another certain commodity, right? So five pizzas, for example, can be traded for 10 apples, right? And 10 apples for maybe two slices of bacon, and those two slices of bacon for five pizzas. You can um, shuffle those around, and you know through this process, you can determine what the exchange value of a specific commodity is. And this is primitive exchange. This is how uh, we used to barter uh, products and commodities around. But things are a little bit more complicated now because we have money. So um, this is the money f uh, form of value. And um, it's essentially the same thing. It's just that instead of a certain commodity, we measure the exchange value of certain products in terms of their price or the amount of currency, you know, necessary to purchase that commodity. There are some flaws with using currency and prices, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about capitalist production. But all we need to know here is that the money form of value is um, the value, the exchange value of a specific commodity, you know, in terms of how much can be traded for uh, in dollars or in gold or anything else and uh, the money form of value is um, you know somewhat of a fiat right the only reason gold has the value 
that it has or uh, money has the value that it has is because people uh, put their faith or their trust in its exchange, right? They don't have any intention on using the paper of the dollar bill or the um, intrinsic properties of the gold usually. They intend on trading it or uh, maintaining its value because it can be traded for something else that they can use. How are all these commodities related? Well, according to uh, the general form of value and the money form of value, all of these things have something in common. And that's beyond just the price of these commodities or the amount of currency necessary to exchange these commodities. They have something else in common with each other, right? And um, we're going to have to measure that um, by using a theory that was posited by the classical economists. And this is the labor theory of value. And one of the other misconceptions that we want to do away with here is that the labor theory of value comes from Marx. That's actually not true. You know, Karl Marx never described his value form theory as the labor theory of value. Um, but he did build upon it, right? And the pioneers of the labor theory of value are from the classical, uh, classical economists Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And these people, you know, suggested that, you know, because all of these commodities have um, this intrinsic property, you know, connected to them, that, um, you know, they originate, the value of them originates from the socially necessary labor to produce them. Um, and if we look at this, we can determine that what gives these products their exchange value or what um, relates all these products to one another is that they have labor, right, necessary to produce them. What all of these commodities have in common is socially necessary labor um, to produce them. How do we measure this? How do we measure, you know, this sort of socially necessary labor figure? And how then do we find, you know, what gives a product its exchange value? Well, in order to find this figure, we're going to need a constant value, right? A value that doesn't change, you know, despite the variables that might affect the exchange value of a specific product. And this value is time. And time does not change based on, you know, the fluctuations of price or the changes of exchange value or any other factors. Time stays the same, right? So we can look at labor in terms of units of time, right? By dividing, you know, labor with the amount of time necessary to produce a specific product. And because the labor theory of value is a social theory, we will find this labor figure um, as an average amount because the labor of one individual or group may differ from the labor or um, uh, the labor of another individual or group, right? And because of that variance, we're going to want to find, you know, the difference, you know, between those labor variables or the average, sorry, uh, in terms of units of time. And that will give us the value of that produced commodity. Let's look at pizza. Let's try and put this into a, an illustration that we can all understand. So this is our pizza, and the cheese, we'll say, um, equals an exchange of something that is equivalent to a half an hour of labor, right? The dough here, of course, is also equal to an exchange that is equivalent to the half an hour um, of labor as well. And we can add pepperoni to this pizza, right? And, you know, this would increase the value of this pizza by another half hour. Right. So, you know, beforehand we were looking at a pizza that was worth, you know, what is equivalent to an hour's worth of labor in value. Right. Not um, an hour necessary to produce this pizza, an hour's worth of value. And it's or yeah, and an hour's worth of value. So it's important not to confuse those two. And then this pepperoni here is equivalent to another value that can be the price of the pepperoni or the exchange of something else that's also equivalent to half an hour of labor. Right. And at this stage, we're looking at a pizza when we add up all these values together uh, to be about um, one and a half hours worth of labor, right? Or the exchange that's equivalent to one and a half hours of labor. What is use value? Uh, we're moving away from exchange value a little bit, and we're going to get into use value. And uh, use value is something aside from the labor theory of value. This is not something that Adam Smith and David Ricardo um, you know, brought into the labor theory of value, but it is something that um, they, I, I believe they realized. And the use value of a commodity, according to Marx, is realized only upon the consumption of that commodity, right? And that is to say that the use value of a commodity has very specific or intrinsic properties to them that make them valuable or make them useful, right? So, um, you know, for example, you know, uh, an iPhone has, you know, specific properties that make it useful 
you know, for someone to want to buy, right? You have no intention of bringing that phone back into the market. You intend on using that phone for yourself, and that's why you purchased that phone. And that's the use value of that product. And the use value usually characterizes the needs and wants of a specific individual or a whole group, right? And it usually satisfies, you know, those needs and wants as well. And we're looking at things like cars, your iPhone, as we've discussed, or food, right? Food is a good example of, you know, something that has a lot of use value, right? They characterize, you know, the needs and wants of individuals and groups, and um, they are valuable because of the properties that are associated with them. You know, you use a car to move around, right? You use a phone to communicate and you use food to eat it and survive. Uh, what are examples of things that don't have use value? Well, shares of a company or stocks, right? You're not going to use those, but they potentially can have more use value or, sorry, exchange value than food, right? Or your iPhone even, right? Shares of a company, you know, specifically are traded around because of the exchange value that's associated with them. Uh, they don't have use value themselves. You don't intend on using a share of a company, whatever that means. You intend on trading that share, right? So you're purchasing, you have demand for this product because of its exchange value, and then you can translate that exchange value into something else that has use value. So you sell this stock here, and you buy food with the money that you've earned or profited from. Another example of something that doesn't have use value is money, actually. You know, money doesn't have any use value. Uh, the usage of money is the act of trading it, right? You move money around so that you can get these things, right? So this thing has exchange value, of course, right? But, you know, in terms of use value, um, it has no consumption. It's, uh, just a, it's just a paper bill. Let's go back to our pizza, right? Um... So, you know, we talk about use value and exchange value, but we have to come back to this question of whether or not they're subjectively realized or objectively realized, right? And, you know, that brings us back to the first question that was posed by the Austrians. And, um, you know, the answer to this one actually isn't uh, resolved among Marxists. You know, Marx himself would have said that it is objective. The intrinsic qualities of a product are objective. Um, but... You know, um, some Marxists also believe that, you know, these properties or, you know, your value that you put in the usage of a specific commodity is something that can only be realized by you, right? Um, now, again, this is up for debate. Um, this is an, an important part of our lesson um, as much as it is to understand exchange value and use value and the different forms of expression of exchange value. But me personally, I think you know, that this value is objectively realized. And we can demonstrate this in our pizza example, right? So this pizza here, the pizza that we built earlier, is worth one and a half hours of labor, right, when we add up all these values. In New York, though, you can buy a pizza with gold flakes. Look how pretty that is, right? But you're adding about 50 hours worth of labor on that pizza, right? Or you're adding a certain amount of money. This is a hypothetical figure that I just built up might not be true, I'm not sure. But you're increasing the value of this pizza nonetheless, right? Now, this pizza is considerably more expensive. You know, the pizza that uh, they sell in New York City with all the gold flakes on it uh, costs $2,000, right? So the exchange value of this pizza is much higher, right? But you're not exchanging this pizza. You're not buying this pizza to flip it. You're buying it to eat it, right? So, um... Does this pizza have, you know, the use value of an ordinary pizza without gold flakes? Well, yes, right? The same resources are in this pizza that are necessary to fulfill you, and these gold flakes are practically useless. However, this pizza is 51 and a half hours of labor when your previous pizza was only one and a half hours of labor. So, you know, what's really taking place here, right? You have a huge increase in exchange value, right? But the increase in use value, there is none right? So I would say that, you know, for the most part, you know, while, you know, maybe subjectively you like the gold flakes more, you know, how valuable is the pizza based on the resources that are involved and what you're using that resource for? You know, these are specific to the qualities of that product or commodity, right? And the gold itself does not have any redeeming qualities or properties about it that make it actually useful for consumption. They're just things that you like to put on your pizza. So when we talk about whether or not the value of this pizza is subjectively realized, right, we're kind of asking ourselves a pretty dumb question, 
Right. I mean, obviously, this pizza is not going to feed you any more than a pizza without gold flakes on it. And, you know, by standards of use value, you know, a pizza with sausage on it would be more valuable than a pizza with gold flakes on it. But this one's much more expensive. So, you know, while this is still in the realm of debate, I'll leave it for you guys to decide whether or not this value is uh, necessarily subjective or objective. Um, or maybe pose your own theories based on what you think, you know, the difference is between you know, use value that is objectively realized and, you know, a subjective kind of appreciation for the pretty gold flakes you have on your pizza. Anyway, this is going to do it for our lesson. Um, you know, most of these concepts are pretty easy to understand, um, but it's important to get this out of the way so that we can understand uh, in further detail the flaws of capitalist production, right, as well as, you know, some other various Marxist concepts that lean on understanding the different forms of value. I highly suggest that you go to the website and you download the questions or you try and answer them just from, you know, the web page, right? If you're able to answer them, you'll have understood this lesson probably pretty well, right? And, um, you know, we'll talk more about value form and we'll talk much more about price and exchange value specifically, you know, in future lessons. Um, but we're not going to come back to, um, you know, some of these concepts. So, you know, make sure that, um, you know, you understand everything in this video. And again, you know, if you want to look at uh, further resources on this topic, we'll have some reading for you uh, there as well. I hope to see you guys the next lesson. I hope this uh, has taught you something, even if you don't plan on returning to these lessons. Um, you know, maybe, you know, you've learned a little bit more about how Marxists see the economy or the value of something, you know, that's traded around. Um, you know, that's the goal here. So I'll see you guys next time. Um, the next lesson will be posted online. Um, I'm not sure if it'll be a PowerPoint like this one or we'll just post um, the, the recording of the in-person uh, lesson this time. Um, you know, hopefully by then my audio recording won't uh, fuck up again. <laughs> so um, we'll have to cross our fingers there. But um, I'm excited to see you guys the next lesson. Cheerio.